Ramsay's right royal rounder. Yes, she is royalty herself. She is the queen of our hearts. It's Kinsey Schofield. Morning, Kinsey. Good morning. I know this, um, the post office story is crazy. I can't imagine how people would respond if something like that happened here. But it's like you said, it might have. Well, Technology might have already messed up and somebody's not being believed already. Do you know what? It, it, it's so interesting you say that because I was watching the story, watching the drama last night. And I, I did think of, of, of America, actually. And I just thought this is one of those occasions where I'm actually glad that that, that we don't have guns here, because you honestly, oh. it's, it's it's just you know I'm not suggesting that anyone commits any kind of violent act, but it, it's one of those times where I just thought, do you know, what? I think I understand why people just just get a gun and go crazy. It was like, do you know, do you know when you, um, do you know what it reminded me of watching this thing was the movie with uh, Michael Douglas falling down. Have you ever seen that movie, Falling Down? No, but I love a good Michael Douglas movie, oh, it's so that's on my agenda. It's absolutely brilliant. It's, a, it's, it's about a man who, uh, you know, middle-aged man, and, and he's actually going through, uh, you know, he's clearly going through some really tough stuff, and it concerns his, his marriage breaking down and all of these things. And, and he, 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 he starts to lose it, but you kind of sympathise with him. So there's a scene where he walks into... Um, a burger restaurant and he, he says oh I'd, I'd love to have like breakfast please and the burger restaurant says uh, oh I'm, you, you, I'm afraid you can't have breakfast it's 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 one minute past 11 and he says yeah but I, I can see the breakfast can I can I have some? no I'm so sorry our policy is one minute past 11. so he takes out a gun and he's like you are going to serve me this breakfast and Here's that is your bacon. Yeah, the, the manager says, "Okay, here you go." And he sets off the gun by accident, <laughs> and the tiny hits the ceiling. But it is—it's one of those movies where you say, "Oh my God, I understand that. I, I understand that frustration where the person behind the counter is saying, "No, I'm sorry. Yes, you can see the breakfast." This you makes no sense to me. But, but you can't have it because it's one minute past eleven. You'll have to order from the lunch menu. And he said, but I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. So, uh, it, and it's one of those. It reminds you of that. You should watch Falling Down because it's actually a brilliant film about a man's descent into insanity by the, by the hurdles that life puts in front of you and, and his disproportionate response to those hurdles. And this post office drama is a part of that. In America, in America, they turn up with guns. In America, they would turn up to the post office, head office, with guns. I can't, I can't deny it. Every time, you know, there is a shooting that is at an office building, there are, it's either one of two things. It's either a disgruntled employee because they've lost their job or they feel like they've been treated unfairly, or it's a love triangle. So, I mean, unfortunately, that is the reputation my country has. Um, so, can I just uh, tell you something? I've got to say something to you before you go. Uh, before we go ahead, all right. Thomas has said, and I've, he does this every week, and I always forget. Please, <laughs> he's written this in capital letters. Please, could you give Kinsey a good morning from me? It would lift my mood from good to ecstatic. So, Thomas says, "Good morning." Thomas, you have lifted my mood from good to ecstatic. Thank you so much. There. Uh, Thomas, are you happy that Kinsey has said good morning to you? By the way, it does not, it, it does not ask me to say good morning to him. It's, uh, it's just you. It's, uh, that's all he wants. Um, well, he knows we're a package deal, so... <laughs> we are. We are buy one, get one free. And we've also been shocking. We've not done another Majesty. We've been terrible this week. I've had a couple of messages from people saying, when are you going to do another one? We've got to get it together, haven't we? We're a terrible, we're a terrible couple. I know, I know. I was just thinking about how crazy my week was. Yeah, but same bit. We have to do it. We we will have to do that. Um, I can't wait to hear... I really want to hear you unfiltered about Prince Andrew because <laughs> yeah. some of this stuff that's come out, I'm just like... And I had people reach out to me and say, does this change your opinion of the royal family? And my immediate answer is no, but it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, you, you know, pe the people that support the royal family and are so devoted to them it, it is difficult for them to understand how they can continue to support andrew so it's an interesting conversation to have um, and i tell you something um and you know, obviously there's been all this furore about the 
post office, um, we have two dramas mm -hmm. about Prince Andrew on the horizon. One with Amazon. You were almost in one of them. <laughs> You shouldn't say that, but that's true. I did audition for one of them. You're right. I did. I, I, I think I can say it now. I auditioned for a part in in uh, one of them. And uh, 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 clearly, I got very far. I got so far that I'm, I'm still sat here at five in the morning. Um, <laughs> no, I would have still done this job anyway. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I auditioned for one of the parts. I read for it. And, um, oh, my God, if I could have got into the Prince Andrew drama... I think that that would have made my life. It would have been brilliant. And we've still said as well, at some point, we're going to reenact my audition, aren't we? I cannot wait to do that. Yeah, we're going to reenact my audition at some point. We'll do that on, on a Majesty podcast. But yes, but, but the point I'm making is that um, if those dramas are anything to go by, so there's one on Netflix, which has got uh, uh, Gillian Anderson in, uh, one on Amazon uh, as well, and... If if the post office drama is anything to go by, it it may just bring it all back up and have people you know baying for Prince Andrew's head. Also, keep in mind that scripted dramas, especially scripted dramas that have competing clones like mm. these two, these are two uh, scripted dramas about the exact same subject that are likely going to come out around the same time. They're going to be as salacious and as shocking as possible because they want you to tune in. They want everybody talking about it on social media and they're trying to come out, they're trying to both ease that out the winner when it comes to who's turning on whatever Prince Andrew drama. So it's, it's they're they're going to be good and, and they're going to be probably uh, pretty scandalous. And if I were Prince Andrew, I would be sitting there absolutely bricking it at the moment, thinking what on earth is on the horizon because you're absolutely right they will take they will make it as dramatic as possible but then that's also not forget they probably don't need to make it that dramatic because you, you know a lot of things like the crown they have to try and throw in some drama don't they where perhaps there wasn't as much they have to throw in some conflict where perhaps you didn't know for sure that it was there before. With this story, with the Epstein story, I mean, you could literally just write it as, as it happened. You could write it based on what Prince Andrew himself has admitted to, which, of course, is not any wrongdoing, but just what and he's admitted sweating. to. Not sweating. Not sweating. He's admitted to not sweating. Yeah. Uh, I bet he is now. And it would still be dramatic enough. It would still be dramatic enough, so it, I think it's going to be uh, a really interesting one. So, Kinsey Schofield, who still joins us, what do we know about this new book and uh, the late Queen's final moments? Yeah, these um, details are found within this book called Charles III, New King, New Court, The Inside Story by Robert Hardman. Uh, he talks about how... Um, he had access to Queen Elizabeth's personal aides memo from the day that the Queen died at Balmoral Castle. And the, this memo reads that the Queen died peacefully. She died peacefully in her sleep. Uh, and uh, it stressed that she would not have been aware of anything that was going on. She, she wasn't feeling any pain. I know this is something that you and I have debated in the past or not necessarily debated, but it's certainly something we were concerned with in the past after Giles Brandwith alleged that, and I don't, I, I'm ha gonna have to read Robert's book, but Giles Brandwith alleges that the queen had a form of bone cancer that we knew to be incredibly painful. Um, so Robert Hardman says died peacefully without pain which is important to royal watchers uh, and i'm eager to see if he says the same about the queen's alleged bone cancer um that giles brandwith had reported in the past uh, but well, also I, mean, I, I think just, just to jump in i think that she clearly was in pain at, at points before uh, uh those final days because that was why she had to pull out of so many engagements those mobility issues um, I think were as a result of that, but it, it's heartening to hear that 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 maybe in her her final days, which of course she was working right up until the very end, um, right up until the very end, and her final hours, um, she didn't appear to be in pain, which I think is 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 nice to know. 
Yeah, but, you know, talking about her working up until her final hours, in her, you know, pristine red box, there were two letters. Um, one was to Sir Edward Young, her private secretary, and the other was to King Charles. And while Hardman says that we'll likely never know what was written inside these letters, which might not be true. King Charles might submit them to the archive one day. Uh, he does stress that it's proof that the queen knew that the end was imminent and had planned accordingly, which I thought was an interesting piece of information as well. But, you know, he obviously an, an insider talks about how uh, the king was addressed as your majesty for the very first time in the car on the way back to Balmoral from his estate after finding out that his mom had passed. I mean, there's only two people, likely two or three people in that car with him, right? So uh, clearly that's some inside information about the king being addressed for as your majesty for the very first time at age 73. Uh, and then um, I thought it was interesting that he says that it was the princess of wales that chose to stay back and not be with the family and not be uh, with the dying queen because she thought it was important that she be there to support the children as we know in spare harry claims that the king told him that he held catherine back to justify megan not being invited to the queen's bedside around the time of her death so yeah this was this was princess catherine who herself chose uh, because the children had not long because it was September of course they'd not long started the new school year um, they'd not long started school uh, she felt that if the end was nigh um, that one parent should still be around the children um, and that was why she chose not to go to Balmoral and you, you're absolutely Which, by right. the way, I've been, re I've, been, I've been reporting that from day one. I remember Fox News asking me, because, you know, they like the gossip over here in America. And the day after the Queen died, Fox News asking me on their morning show, so did Kate have to stay back because me they didn't want Meghan there? And I was like, no, it, it's the first week for, of school. Catherine is going to want to be there to be with her children. So I'm so, and it, it was Harry that changed that story in spare by basically saying that the king told him that Catherine was staying back because it was, you know, immediate family members only. So Megan wouldn't be welcome anyway to justify yeah. them not wanting Megan there. Well, it's all about them. I mean, it's all Always. about them. Everything's all about them. You know, the, 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 the queen, uh, when she died and, and Catherine staying behind, Princess Catherine staying behind, the, then, the now Princess of Wales, it must have been about them can't possibly have been that she was trying to be a, a good mum and, 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 and trying to stay behind with uh, the children. And actually, I was reflecting on this, that it was also probably exactly what the late Queen would have wanted as well. She, she'd have said, oh, just, 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 just... Because the only other option would be bring the children with you to Balmoral, because... I do believe that I read in another portion of Hardman's book these, you know, because we're just getting bits and pieces yes. of it as we lead up to the release, that the Queen did not like a, just like Prince Philip, the Queen did not like a parade of individuals at her bedside when she was ill. And so you're right. To your point, I, I actually do believe, uh, I do do remember reading that, that similar to Prince Philip, that is the last thing Queen Elizabeth wanted or, uh, or, or liked. The parade of individuals coming in to see her when she was ill or, God forbid, on her deathbed. Well, the only people that I believe she would have wanted would have been her four children and, and the, the uh, other heir, which would have been then Prince William but well, he is I mean Prince I think William. she would have been happy to have Catherine there I think she would have been pleased to have Catherine there but she was far away and Princess Anne Princess Royal had revealed a few weeks if not months ago that the Queen was actually concerned about dying at Balmoral she felt like it was going to be an inconvenience and the family was like no 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 don't even think that way um, if Catherine would have been conveniently around Absolutely, she would have been welcome there because I do think that it was like a, a grand, she was truly like a granddaughter to her. But you're right, it, it, she would just want the core. She would just want, she wouldn't yeah. want, she would not want Meghan Markle there. Well, yeah, I, I actually completely agree with that. Now, um, just one thing on that, and, and you just touched on it. 
I, the, the extract of that that I absolutely love was that no one had really thought about, and I never thought of this as well, is that when people don't know that the, that the late Queen has died, when do you refer to Prince Charles as your majesty? And when does he refer to himself as the king? Because he can't ring... There was a moment where... He wanted to be put through to, to, to William, Prince William. To Prince William to tell him that the Queen had died and he had to ring the switchboard and he couldn't it's say me. to the switchboard, it's the King, because then the switchboard knows that the Queen has died before Prince William has died. He can't then go through to Prince William and say, it's the King. He has to say, it's me. And he had mm -hmm. to think about this because no one had really thought about the logistics of that, which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah, when, when we were reading through that article together, I said to you, like, where's this season of The Crown? Because it's so beautifully detailed that you can visualize it. And so I'm really looking forward to, to getting my hands on this book. And I'm going to read it start to finish probably in less than a day because he does beautifully illustrate these moments that... Um, and, and it does, it, you know, I do feel like The Crown feels a little voyeuristic sometimes, but as a royal watcher, I really eat it up. I have no regrets. Okay, so um, can I ask you a question? I always ask you a question. Um, who is, according to um, Sylvia Venturini Fendi, who is the matriarch of the famous fashion house Fendi, of course, um, mm -hmm. who is the most stylish royal who Fendi describes as the most elegant woman in the world. Oh my, is it, Lu is it Louise Windsor? Lady Louise Windsor? Is it Lady something? So elegant that actually the matriarch of this fashion house um, has inspired her latest collection, has, has based her latest collection on this royal. Uh, if if you ask me who the most stylish royal was, I would tell you Zara. Mm -hmm. I know it, the I know the right answer is probably um, to the general public is probably Catherine, the Princess of Wales. But I think Zara, and I have no idea who you're talking about. It is actually Princess Anne, the Princess oh Royal. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's goodness. true. Uh, the Italian fashion that's designer. That's amazing. So what is this going to look like? I imagine a lot of cool olives, like olive greens. I am, I, I can see this. I can see this. Actually, you're not wrong. She said she calls the king's sister the most elegant woman in the world. Um, she said that Princess Anne had inspired her to create a men's collection that was a little bit town and country. I fell in love with the style of Princess Anne, who in my mind is the most elegant woman in the world. When I saw the coronation last year with Princess Anne in her uniform, I thought she looked beautiful. So I said, let's be inspired for a men's collection. She said she took the Princess Royal singular approach to dressing and applied it to men's clothing whilst adding a layer of her fashion house's luxury and... She says, the Princess Royal is very rigorous in how she dresses with this kind of military-minded attitude, but feminine at the same time. And um, because she's an anti-fashion person, to me, that's something that's actually very fashionable and chic. I mean, even if somebody does say the Princess Royal is anti-fashion, she has never in my lifetime looked unput together. Yes, but she... she as my mother always says, and my mother is... She's not is, trendy. She's not trendy. Yes, but those who've got it don't flaunt it, and those who haven't do. And I think that, that that's... There's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to be said that, that I think the most fashionable people look like they've not really tried that much. Even though they might have done, it doesn't look like th that they are... You know, they may be put together, but it doesn't look like they've really tried to be put together. And I think that that is what Princess Anne actually has. And also, as well, um, that she still wears things from sort of 30, 40 years ago. Right. Well, I'm just dying a little inside because I just uploaded a photo of myself to Instagram wearing multiple different prints because I was trying to look fashionable and you just called me out for being unfashionable. And I'm ashamed of myself, OK? Well, you've got to, you've got to look like you've not tried. That's, that is the key 
to being fashionable is to look like you have to try when you're wearing three pairs of spanks okay there's a lot of effort in that Christo. actually i've only got two pairs on at the moment so i <laughs> I, I feel your pair when I, when I wear the third pair it really does it starts cutting off circulation to places that that, that men need circulation <laughs> that's all i'm saying that's all i'm saying so 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 two pairs is my limit of spanks well Anybody getting ready for church listening to you right now is going to say a prayer for both of us when they get there. All right, we've got one minute. Do you want to talk about Camilla's podcast or is there anything else? Um, well, I, I don't know. I haven't had a chance to listen to Camilla's podcast. I'm going to heavily invest in it now because I read an article today from The Guardian that's criticizing the Queen's reading room because she's hardly on it. So, I mean, immediately you think, oh my gosh, remember when Meghan had other people fill in for her on archetypes? Like, I feel like this is a risk they take when they open themselves up t too much. Um, and so I... I'm hoping that her team listens to the feedback, but doesn't give away too much of the royal mystery in allowing her to participate in in, in, in this venture. I mean, Sarah Ferguson is one thing, the queen is another. Well, exactly, you know, she can have a little bit to do with it, but we don't want too much from her because uh, you're right, we need a bit of mystique. We need it to be a little bit, you know, a, a little bit of, of mystique around the whole thing. Lovely to have you, as always. There's no mystique around us. There's nothing that's no. secret between us. Uh, that is Kinsey Schofield uh, with a Right Royal Roundup.